Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor Julia Hayes. I'm one of the associate pastors here, and it is my great joy to welcome you to this service of worship here at The Vine, an online campus of Wrightsville United Methodist Church. Today, we are officially kicking off our Love Your Neighbor Kindness Campaign. You are going to be hearing more about this throughout the service, but I hope that you will participate with us in our random acts of kindness and all of the ways that we're going to be trying to especially and intentionally love our neighbors over the next couple of weeks. I want to make sure that you go and check us out on social media, on uh, Facebook and on Instagram so that you can be following along and participating in that way. Now I invite you to take a big, deep breath and let's prepare our hearts for worship. Please join me now in our opening congregational prayer. The words will be found on your screen. Let's pray now together. Gracious God, give to us the mind of Christ, who loved God and loved his neighbor, who healed the sick, fed the hungry, and prayed for the forgiveness of those who rejected him. May we follow his path in this life and the life to come. Amen. His love through humble service bore the weight of human need, who upon the cross forsaken offered mercy's perfect deed. We, your servants, bring to worship not a voice alone, but heart, consecrating to your purpose every gift that you impart. worship to your service forth in your dear name we go to the child the youth the aged love and living deeds to show hope and health goodwill and comfort counsel aid and peace we give that your servants lord in freedom may your mercy know and live Good morning, church. My name is Eun Siu Kang. I'm one of the associate pastors here. It is my great joy to get to lead us in prayer today. Please join me as we pray together. Holy and loving God, thank you for giving us a new day and new life. We come to you today, each carrying the stories of our lives, the joys, the worries, the hopes, and the burdens. You see them all, Lord, and you welcome us just as we are. We thank you for the gift of your love that encounters us in every season. And today, we ask for your grace to help us share that love more fully with those around us. Lord, as we begin our kindness campaign, we pray that our small act of love will glorify your name and spread your light in the world. May each moment of our lives reflect your heart. Let our words be gentle, our hands be willing to serve, and our heart be open to embracing those we meet along the way. We also lift up those who are hurting and struggling right now because of the recent hurricanes. For those who have lost home and communities, wrap them in your comfort and surround them with people who will stand with them through this difficult time. And teach us how to best serve and support so that our help can truly bring hope and healing. And now we lift before you those whom we name with our voices or hold silently in our hearts.
Lord, hear our prayers. Pour out your grace and love upon them and guide us, filled with your love and ready to share it. May we be neighbors who care deeply, act justly, and walk humbly with you. We humbly offer this prayer in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now take a moment to offer our hearts and gifts. As we respond to God's grace and generosity, you can contribute to the ministry of Ricefield United Methodist Church through website and via mail. Let us continue to worship God. Hello friends, I'm Pastor Eunsu. How are you today? I'm so excited to share this time with y'all. I have a little game for you. I'm gonna describe some acts of kindness and I want you to guess what they are. Are you ready? Okay, so first one, what is something you can say to someone in the morning that says hello? Yes, good morning. It is very simple, but we can say good morning, right? Okay, and the next one, what can you say to someone who helps you to show that you appreciate them? Yes, you can say thank you, thank you so much, and I appreciate that, right? And the last one, what can you say to someone to let them know they did a great job? Yes, you can say good job, great job, and well done, and thank you for doing this, right? Great job, Ricefield kids. You really know what kindness looks like. And the cool thing is, these are all things that you can do to show your love to others. So today, we're talking about what it means to love our neighbors. And do you know who your neighbors are? Neighbors are not just the people who live next door. They can be anyone around you, like your family, your friends, and your teachers, and even the person you can see at the grocery store. And God asks us to love your neighbors by being kind. Sometimes we think that to show our love or love our neighbors, we have to do something really big like giving lots of money or doing something in a very huge way. But that is not true. Love can be shown in small way too, just like saying, good morning, thank you, and great job, right? So today, here is something very special that I wanna share with you. This is a kindness bingo, and it's full of a simple act of kindness you can do every day for the next three days. Um, and here's the best things. Mm, some of the things that mm, probably you need a little more help. That means you get to invite your parents and or your grandparents or grown-ups to join you. And when you are doing together, you are spreading kindness and love together. So you could ask um, to your parents to surprise a neighbor with freshly baked cookies or trees. Or you could work together to send a thank you card to the local fire department, right? And, and then every time you could do something, you can mark it off. And when you accomplish a whole row, you get a bingo. It is so, it's so much fun, right? 
So let us imagine if all of us and all of us just were doing little simple kind of uh, kindness here, we would spread in kindness and love just like Jesus did. So this week, let's start by sharing this kindness and don't forget about inviting your families, okay? Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for loving us and thank you for teaching us how to love. Help us be kind and caring others. We love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, Amen. I love grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Doug Lane. I'm senior pastor here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church, and I'm glad that you've taken time to worship with us on the vine. You've heard that we're in the middle of a series called Be Like Jesus, and we're kicking off a new campaign called Love Your Neighbor. It's a kindness campaign, a way to treat our neighbors as we would want to be treated over the next 30 days. And so we're going to uh, go into today's scripture um, with kind of both of those things, the be like Jesus, love your neighbor, um, themes both in our heads as we hear the story about Jesus and Zacchaeus from Luke chapter 19. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him, because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, He's gone to the guest of one who's a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I'll pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and save the lost. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Almighty and everlasting God, we thank you that you have come to save each and every one of us. Lord, we have all felt lost, and we know that we're not, if we just remember that you were there. So Lord, I pray that we might feel your presence today. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, to be honest, I don't know what it's like to live on the fringe of society. I'm a white man born into a comfortable family in a nice neighborhood in the suburban south. When I grew up, I went to college and grad school, and I've always had a job and a stable home life. Now, I wouldn't say I was born with a silver spoon in my mouth, but I've had some advantages compared to a lot of people in this country, and especially compared to a lot of people around the world. Nevertheless, I've also had plenty of problems. We've all had problems. And I certainly know what it means to feel rejected by people. We learn that at an early age, don't we? The friend we wanted to play with goes to play with someone else on the playground. Later, we find out there's a birthday party being planned by one of our classmates, and we didn't get an invitation. We're rejected when we want to have a romantic relationship. We're rejected by colleges and when we're applying for a job or a promotion. And those parties keep happening, and while we're invited to some, we're not invited to them all. In my line of work, sometimes people reject the message I'm trying to share. And sometimes, to be honest, it's not the message, it's the messenger. That's life. I don't like it, but I accept that rejection is part of it. Right after the brilliant founder of Apple, Steve Jobs, died, someone made this observation. They said, 20 years ago, our world had Steve Jobs, Johnny Cash, and Bob Hope. Now we have no jobs, no cash, and no hope. It's true, of course, there are people who are unemployed, and there are probably even more people who are out of cash, but if Jesus Christ is who he said he was and did what he said he did, well, then nobody should ever be without hope. That's especially true of people who are on the fringe, people that we would consider struggling. In this series we've been doing called Be Like Jesus, we've been amazed and astounded at how so often the very people that we turn our backs on 
are the same people that Jesus turned his face toward. The very people we don't give the time of day to, Jesus gave most of his time to. Today we're going to study about an encounter that Jesus had with a total reject. I first learned about this man when I was in preschool, and I suspect many of you did too. I learned about him in a song. I wonder if you know this song. If you know it, sing along with me, okay? Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in that tree. And he said, Zacchaeus, you come down, for I'm going to your house today, for I'm going to your house to stay. That song comes out of this story. The first two verses of this chapter clue us into just how interesting this story is going to be. It says, Jesus entered Jericho and was going through, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. The story obviously takes place in Jericho, a city about 17 miles northeast of Jerusalem. It's a border city near modern-day Jordan, set at an international crossroads. It's a place where the northern, southern, eastern, and western highways all come together. It was a rich city back then due to its great palm forests and fig trees. Taxes were actually um, collected at three places in Israel, in Capernaum, in Jericho, and Jerusalem. But Jericho was by far the most lucrative. Luke tells us that Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector. It's the only time we see this term in the New Testament. Now to refresh your memory, the Romans, of course, occupied Israel at this time, and the Roman government would collect taxes from the people to pay for government services and infrastructure, just like the IRS does today. Where the systems differ is that the Romans would bid out the position of tax collector to whoever would pay them the most. They would then give that person a quota of taxes to collect, but the collector was not limited to that quota. They weren't paid a salary. Instead, they made money by adding a surcharge or a user's fee like Ticketmaster does or an ATM machine might. That surcharge could be as high as they wanted it to be, and you had to pay it. But Zacchaeus wasn't just a tax collector. He was the chief tax collector. In other words, he had other tax collectors working under him. In effect, he was the CEO of a tax collecting corporation, and he had people under him who went out and did the dirty work, and they paid him the greatest part of the profit. So he's kind of part IRS agent and also part mafia boss, if you will. And it's all perfectly okay with the Roman government. Now you talk about a reject. He was a tax collector for the Romans. That made him a thief and a traitor in the eyes of the Jews. His family would have probably disowned him. His friends would have long ago deserted him. And everybody he encountered feared and despised him. But that's his own fault. His rejection came honestly. The chief tax collector in Jericho was considered no better than a murderer to the Jews. Now he did have power and money, but he was hated by everybody. In fact, he didn't even deserve the name that he had. You see, the name Zacchaeus actually means clean or innocent. And Zacchaeus was anything but that. He was dirty and he was guilty. The story tells us in verse 3 that Zacchaeus was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. Now at this point, Jesus has been ministering for about three years. His fame and name are spread all over the countryside. This man who could raise the dead, walk on water, calm a storm, and feed thousands with just a couple of Lunchables was coming to Jericho. So there's no farming today, no schoolwork today, no work in the office. The whole city has turned out to see Jesus. The streets are jammed and all the front seats are already gone. It's a sellout crowd, standing room only. The only seats left are in the nosebleed section way up in the trees. Well, Zacchaeus has a problem. He's small in stature. And considering that people weren't as tall then as they are now, I suspect he was probably less than five feet tall. 
Imagine Danny DeVito climbing up into that sycamore tree, if that helps you paint a picture. Now, when we went to Jericho just a few years ago, my wife and I went with a group from church. There was a guide who showed us a local sycamore tree. The tree was probably 30 feet high with very wide branches. It's a pretty tree, a tree that would be easy to climb. But in Jesus' day, it would have been very undignified for a man to climb up a tree, especially the chief tax collector. So we know Zacchaeus is short, but why was he so determined to see Jesus that he's willing to go climb a tree? I mean, I've been in positions where I didn't have a good view either, but I never thought I'd go shimmy up the nearest live oak or pine. How many people in this world would you be willing to climb a tree to go see? I'm going to throw something out there. At this time in his life, Jesus has developed a reputation. But not everybody likes him. For instance, we've been talking about the Pharisees a lot this fall. And other than Nicodemus, the rest of the Pharisees didn't care for Jesus at all. The Roman leaders weren't all that excited about him either. So if the government officials didn't like him and the religious leaders didn't like him, who did? Let's hear what people are saying about Jesus. Let's go back to chapter 7 of Luke. And you hear this verse. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking. And you say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Nobody who was anybody was a friend of tax collectors and sinners, but Jesus was. And guess what? Zacchaeus met both those criteria. He's a tax collector and a sinner. So perhaps this man, who probably had no friends, wanted to see Jesus on the off chance that he might finally make a friend. In fact, that's one of the most amazing things about Jesus. People who weren't like Jesus really liked him. The reason is people who felt so unloved by everyone else felt real love from Jesus. Now I want to say something to us as a church, and I want to remind myself of something as your pastor, that the more those who are not followers of Christ are loved by those who are followers of Christ, the more open they may be to actually becoming followers of Christ themselves. It really isn't our job to change people who need to be changed, okay? It's our job to model for them the love of Jesus Christ and put them in a position where they'll be open to Jesus and let him change them, which is what happened in our story. And what we hope to do in our Love Your Neighbor Kindness campaign. You've heard about it already, but over the next 30 days, we want to intentionally be kind to others without expecting anything in return. That's what grace is all about. This is different from how relationships work from a worldly point of view. The world says that relationships are transactional. If you do something for me, then I'll do something for you. Or if you do something for me, then I at least owe you something in return in the future. Now, if I do too much for you and you don't do enough in return, then the relationship gets out of balance, and I'm probably going to resent you, right? But in a grace-filled relationship, there's no keeping score. We act out of kindness just because someone might need it. We expect nothing in return. That's grace. That's what Jesus did. He didn't ask for payback. He just gave. That's what we're asking people to do in our church and community over the next 30 days. Do things for others without expecting anything in return. Here's how Jesus did it in the Zacchaeus story. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down joyfully. Don't miss what happened here. The reason Zacchaeus is even in the Bible is not because he was looking for Jesus. It's because Jesus was looking for him. If Jesus had passed by that tree and never looked up, we never would have known who Zacchaeus was. Jesus found the guy trying to find him. He gave him his undivided attention. And by going to his house, he formed a relationship with someone that everybody else rejected. Remember, Zacchaeus was a man who had always had Thanksgiving dinner by himself. When he cooked out, he only needed one steak because nobody was coming over. 
This is the only time we are ever told that Jesus invited himself to someone else's house. And of all people in the world, it is the chief tax collector, the most hated man in town. Jesus could have stayed with anybody. Anybody would have gladly accepted Jesus, but it, it's not the mayor of the city that got the invitation. It's not the president of the bank either. Not even the rabbi of the largest synagogue or the greatest athlete in town. Instead, it's the reject. As astounding and incredible as it was to this crowd that Jesus had gone to eat with the least likely, least deserving man in town, what happened next was even more astounding. Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I've defrauded anyone, I restore it fourfold. Now we're not told what happened at Zacchaeus' house later that day. We don't know what Jesus had for dinner, what the conversation was all about, or how long he stayed. But whatever else happened that day, we do know Zacchaeus was convicted, converted, and convinced. Jesus had been attentive to his greatest need. Now his greatest need was not to be accepted by the town or even accepted by others. In fact, the greatest need of the reject is not to be accepted by anybody. The greatest need was to accept the fact that he was already accepted by God. And that's exactly what he learned that day. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house since he also is a son of Abraham. He was already loved. Salvation had not come to Zacchaeus because he was going to give all this money away. Salvation was not the result of his giving. Salvation was the cause of his giving. God does not save you when you decide to change. You decide to change when you realize that God saves you. Can you imagine getting a knock on your door and you open it up and there stands Zacchaeus? You got just all kinds of anger you know, flashing through your eyes. You say, you little thief, what do you want now? He says, do you know how much I've taken from you all these years? And you say, yeah, about 100 shekels. And he checks his book and he says, you're right, it's 100 shekels. Here's your 100 shekels back, plus 400 more. Would that make a square? You're like, uh, um, yeah, I guess, but i got to ask you a question. Why? What, what's happened to you? And the wee little man smiles, and with tears in his eyes, he says, well, I met this man named Jesus, and I learned that God receives the rejected, and he rejoices when any of us repent of our sins. Now, I don't want you to miss how this story intersects with your life and mine. Okay, sometimes we need to be the ones to reach out to the rejected and to those of us who have been rejected because of something that we've done. We need to repent of our actions and make things right with the people who have rejected us for whatever we've done to them. Okay, when God comes into your life, he not only makes you right with him, but he also wants you to be made right with everyone else. Things are never right until they're completely right. Zacchaeus was not going to be completely right until he made things right with the people he'd wronged. When Jesus comes into your life, not only should you know it, but other people should see it too. Too many people are like the person I heard about who before he gave his life to Christ, he was always talking bad about others, especially people of other races. And he was judgmental and selfish and cheap and just complained all the time. And then he became a Christian except nothing changed. He kept complaining and talking bad about people and just living for himself. And finally, a friend looked at him and said, I don't mind that you were born again. I just wish you hadn't been born again as yourself. You know, giving your life to Christ does not make us perfect. I mean, for crying out loud, Christ died for our sins. But it should at least move the needle toward his direction. We should have some type of repentance and make some small step that moves us closer to Jesus. Now, if you're listening today, you may need to answer some questions about yourself. Who do you owe? Who have you hurt? Who have you wronged? Who's rejected you because of what you've done to them? 
Are you willing to repay what you owe? To repair what you've broken? To replace what you've taken? If you're still rejected today by those whom you have hurt or mistreated or wronged in the past, the first thing you need to know, the first thing you need to do, is simply let Jesus find you. That's what Jesus says at the end of the story. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Ever felt lost? And likewise, are we willing to be like Jesus to those others that we know have been rejected? Are we willing to look around and find the one who is struggling or cast away by others and give them some attention? Maybe even a relationship? Jesus didn't say that he came to be found by those who are seeking him. He came to seek those who are lost. What motivated Jesus to go to Jericho? I think it's the same thing that motivated Jesus to leave heaven in the first place and take on the form of a human person and then die on the cross. You see, Jesus came to seek and save those who have been rejected. And now... Know that you are found. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You pray with me. Almighty and everlasting God, Lord, we thank you that in the midst of the confusion and heartache and heartbreak that we suffer, we know that we are not lost. We may have felt rejected by others, but we are not rejected by you. In fact, you sent your son, Jesus, to save us from our sins, from our problems, our misdeeds, or to make things right with you. Lord, I pray that we now will have the courage to make things right with others. Not only those that we have hurt, but those that we know that are hurting. Lord, we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know one of us who hasn't felt rejection in some way or another. Sometimes it's because of something we did. Sometimes it's not. You know, I, I, sometimes I have no idea why you know, we're not, we don't have better relationships, not more popular or whatever. Um, you know, sometimes that's just life, right? But I want to let you know that in the midst of all of that, in the midst of any pain we are feeling from something we've done or from being left out, God loves you no matter what. Jesus came to Zacchaeus when he was the most hated man in town. I promise Jesus loves you. Absolutely. Know that. Know that. And then extend that love to others. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.